I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Uh, we are continuing our series in Galatians, and we're going to look at a passage that kind of overlaps Galatians 3 and 4, because there's a consistent analogy throughout the whole passage. So whoever did the chapter divisions for Galatians hundreds of years ago, I don't know what they were doing, putting the, the 4 right in the middle of it, but it's all good. Uh, <laughs> And even though it's not in a nice pattern of sticking to the chapter, I think it's going to be helpful. So let's go ahead and pray first, and then we'll hop into the word together. God, thank you for giving us uh, your word. Thank you for teaching us the truth and for helping us understand uh, your character and what you approve of and disapprove of, uh, and really just how we can show our love to you, God. So we just are so grateful for that. I pray that tonight we really would come to a better understanding uh, together as, as to what pleases you and how we can show our love to you. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in Galatians 3, we're going to be picking up in verse 21. Uh, Throughout this whole book, Paul has been and continues to make his case that Christians are free from the law of the Old Testament. And a possible misunderstanding, as we've been going through, uh, is that, you know, we think the law is not actually good, that it's something uh, negative or harmful or at the least, like, irrelevant, Right? We, we might be tempted to think it's irrelevant for us. But Paul actually addresses this potential misunderstanding in our first passage here. And in Galatians 3, 21 to 22, he says, Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture, in this uh, context, the Old Testament, has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Christ, Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. So the first point on your handout is the law is good. Very simple, nothing complicated here. The law is good. It's God's law. It actually reflects uh, God's character. It shows us the requirements of his righteousness. And because it does those things for us, it actually helps us understand how we can express love for God. I have an example of this that does break down at some point. Probably not too far, honestly, but I think it's still helpful. Uh, One summer when I was a student, I was doing this thing called Chico Project. It was really fun. And there was a group of guys that would gather almost every weekday evening. I think it was like 3 p.m., so maybe afternoon, depending on, you know, where you fall on that. And uh, we would go to David Clark's apartment, and we would play Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I actually didn't play very much, but, like, all the other guys did. There was, like, four to ten people would show up almost every weekday and just like pass around the controller, have fun. You know, the Switch had come out recently, so that might date me a little bit, but it was, it was fun. You know, it was like a good, a good deal. And it was really kind of David, right, to open up his apartment to us. Like it was a really nice time of fellowship. Um, and he didn't require us to do anything in order to do that. It was like, you know, there's no expectations. You just come and, and play Zelda, it's fine. Uh, but as a group, at some point, we just kind of decided like, all right, who's picking up David's Dutch Bros today? Like, that was just a question. It's like, all right, who's, who's doing that? And about halfway through the summer, maybe even before that, all of us knew, like, okay, when you get David Dutch Bros, you either get a Shark Attack Rebel or a Hazelnut Cookie Brevet. And I actually texted David yesterday to confirm this, that I was right. I, it turns out I was right the first time, so that was good. <laughs> if I wasn't, it would kind of defeat the point. The point is that we, we got to know what David appreciated because we wanted to express our appreciation, right? We, we knew that that's what David appreciated. So uh, when in a similar way, okay, similarly to this, that we knew what David approved of from Dutch Bros, God's law tells us what God approves of and what he disapproves of. It tells us how we can express love for him. And if we love God, like we want to express that to him, right? That's what love, love like requires expression. And so, This is why Christians should know and do what God's law says. Not because we're obligated to do it, but because we love God and want to show our appreciation for him. Uh, John Calvin had this to say about the purpose and value of studying God's law. He says, it is as if some servant, right, the servant of a master, already prepared with all earnestness of heart to commend himself to his master, make him happy, must search out and observe his master's ways more carefully in order to conform and accommodate himself to them. And this quote highlights for me kind of the the intentionality, right? There's this carefulness, this 
kind of seeking out, looking for, um, and applying the law of God to our lives. And this applies even to the ceremonial law and the judicial, ju- the judicial law of the nation of Israel. But it's especially true of the moral law of the Old Testament. This shows us what God approves of. So now that we have some understanding of the, the purpose of, and the value of the law, we're going to continue, and this is going to really kick off the, the start of the analogy through, that goes throughout this passage. In verse 23, uh, Paul starts it off. He says, Before the coming of this faith, we were hailed in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now, we're going to sit for a minute on this because it's pretty unusual, at least for me, uh, to think in these terms uh, in these, this day and age. But the picture that Paul is, is painting throughout this passage is that of someone who's an heir to an inheritance. And he's contrasting what it looks like for an heir who's underage, who doesn't have full access, to an heir who has come of age, who has freedom. And for the heir who's underage, right, there's, there's a guardian or a trustee. It might be a more like modern word we'd say for that. I have a definition. I don't even remember what website I got it from, but it, it was good. It says, a trustee is a person who takes responsibility for managing money or assets that have been set aside in a trust for the benefit of someone else. So dream with me for a second. On your next birthday, maybe this is like a really nice dream because your birthday is soon, uh, there's a million dollars waiting for you on your next birthday. Think about that, like, oh man, that's, that's great. Now imagine that someone you respect and like, uh, maybe a, a parent or a close friend or a personal hero, like they have uh, the guardianship over you until you hit your next birthday. And right now, they're basically deciding what's permissible for you to do with this money. Uh, you know, if you want to dip into the inheritance and order a fancy dinner one night, they can be like, no. If you want to invest in something, you have to run it by them first, right? Because you want to make sure that they, ha- that they have the authority to actually choose where it gets invested. Um, is the money yours? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think so, yeah. It's yours. Uh, it, it, but it's under the authority of someone else. So this makes it, this is what Paul is, is picturing for us, is this uh, authority of somebody else is over us until we come of age and receive the inheritance. And in this situation, there are a couple of different goals that I think the guardian has, right? Um, and I think this fits the analogy well. One is to make sure that the money is not misused. Uh, another is to teach you what a ra- wise use of resources is like. So you could ask them, hey, you know, is this a wise use of this money? And they say, yeah, that sounds great. Let's, you know, let's do that. Another is to, to make sure that you receive the full benefits of the inheritance when you come of age, that you don't waste any of it beforehand. You know, when a, a six-year-old could probably spend a million dollars on some crazy stuff. It's like it would not be worth anything in the long term. So the, the guardian is there to make sure that the money is not wasted. And the Greek word translated guardian in this passage it can also mean something like instructor or schoolmaster. And I think that can help us too. Like that, that shows us that the law is, is teaching us. It's helping us to understand the way of righteousness, even though that it's not ultimately the cause of our salvation. And the law instructs us in a few different ways. These things are on your handout. First, it shows us God's character. We talked a little bit about that already. It shows us God's character. Uh, It also shows us our sin. When we measure ourselves against the standard of God's law, we we see that we fall short every time. So it shows us our sin. And then as a result of being instructed in these two truths, uh, we also come to understand our need for God's intervention. Right? If we understand that God is perfect and holy, and we understand that we've sinned against him, we actually, we can know that we need God to save us, that we can't do it ourselves. Now, thankfully, God did intervene. And the method and the effect of this intervention are made clear in the next passage. And in uh, verses 26 to 29 of Galatians 3, Paul says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 
For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed, clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So belonging to Christ makes us heirs. And we're going to talk a little more about this passage, but the first thing I want you to understand here is that heirs are equals. That's the next blank in your handout. Heirs are equals. In God's family, nobody is more important than anybody else. All of us are equally dependent on Christ as our righteousness. All of us are equal heirs in Christ. Now, some people right, have, a, have an amazing impact on the world, like the Apostle Paul, for example, and it might be tempting to think, well, okay, the Apostle Paul is like a, he's like a level 100 Christian, and I'm like a level two. Like, that's our, our value. You know, I'm a two, he's a 100. Um, and, you know, we think there must be different value assigned just because of the, the amount of work he's done, right? Like, he's done so much for God. But let's look at what the Apostle Paul in some other letters says about his own work. Okay, we're going to check out Ephesians, Romans, and 2 Corinthians. In Ephesians, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. He says, I am the least, less than the least of all the Lord's people, but this grace was given to me. In Romans 15, he says, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my ser service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God. And in 2 Corinthians, he says, what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Now, in each of these passages, Paul is clearly pointing back to God. He's saying, I am insignificant. I am less than the least of all God's people. But God wants to use me for this. He says he was given the grace. God made his light shine. Right? This is not something that Paul considered to be uh, valuable for himself. And in this passage, uh, these passages and with the verse in Galatians, we see that although God's people can be in different situations, they may have different purposes, and they may have a different calling on their life, all of God's people are of equal value. By the way, this is like in, in stark contrast to the culture during Paul's time, right? He, he addresses three categories of major social divides in the ancient world, uh, nationality, gender, and social status or authority. Like each of these categories, he states that all of us are one in Christ Jesus. He says there's no difference in value. Now, this doesn't mean there's no distinction between people, that because we're Christians, we're all suddenly the same. Right? We, we don't lose any individuality. He's speaking about the value of individuals. And he's emphasizing there's no difference in importance for the people who are in Christ. Heirs are equals. And he continues this analogy of an heir in chapter 4. So we're finally in chapter, the chapter for this week. It says, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are God's child, God has also made you also an heir. So when an heir comes of age, they receive the inheritance they've been promised, and they're no longer bound by a guardian. So let's go back to that million dollars, right, on your next birthday. On your next birthday, something changes. The ownership of the money doesn't change. It's already yours. Uh, the, the value of the advice of the person who is holding it doesn't change. Actually, it would be really wise to consider what they would want you to do with it. Uh, 
but something does change, and it's that they're no longer in authority over you for how you use your inheritance. You're actually free to use it as you see fit without being dependent on the guardian to verify it. Now, obviously, still wise to check in with the guardian, but they don't have authority over it as they once did. And in the same way that the law no longer is in authority over God's children. And there's something, very, uh, something else really important to recognize here. Uh, we're not God's children by our own merit, right, or by our own nature. It says that God sent his son to redeem those that were under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. We are not naturally born, and no one is naturally born as heirs with Christ. We become heirs through adoption. That's the next blank on your handout. We become heirs through adoption. And especially in a country that is at least nominally Christian, like America, it might be easy to think because you're born in a Christian family, or because you have a lot of Christian friends, or because you go to church, that you were born as a Christian. And that's just not true for anybody. <laughs> Uh, we become heirs through adoption. And it's only by Jesus Christ's completed work on our behalf that we receive this adoption into God's family. This is one of the benefits that Christ purchased by dying on the cross and is promised to everybody who believes in him as their Savior and Lord. So if you put your faith in Christ, you are adopted into God's family. And Paul continues in verse 8. He says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Now the Apostle Paul, again here, he urges the Galatians not to turn back to the things that once enslaved them. And he gives a specific example of keeping the ceremonial times and, and festivals and days that are prescribed in the Old Testament. And he says, if you uh, believe these are binding on people who follow Jesus, if you think they're necessary for salvation, uh, it's just not going to go well for you. And he, he urges them to avoid putting themselves back under that. And in doing this, he, he communicates to us that heirs have real freedom. That's your next blank. Heirs have real freedom. So although we can learn a lot and should learn a lot of what, what pleases God from the Old Testament, we have real freedom in how we live. Now, putting ourselves back under the law's restrictions, treating them as if they can work for our salvation, it actually devalues the freedom given to us by the Father. And John Piper, when he's asked about a specific dietary law, Someone asked him about not eating pork. Uh, this is something in the Old Testament. He said it this way. He said, if a person chooses not to eat pork for various nutritional reasons or preference, that's no big deal. Right? Like, if you just don't like pork, that's fine. Don't eat pork. You're free to eat or not to eat. But the moment that abstinence is invested with biblical authority as the path of obedience or maturity or salvation, a line is crossed that contradicts Christ and the gospel. So putting ourselves or putting other people back under the law as the way of earning salvation or as a way of contributing to it is really based on a faulty perspective of how and why we are saved. Right? Like this is actually a really big deal because we are not saved because we lived perfectly or because we lived better than anybody else. God did not decide to save you because you were better than other people. And the other side of that, that I think maybe is even more uh, commonly believed is we're not saved so that we can live perfectly. Right? There, there is an ongoing process of sanctification. Like David talked about last week, we, we get made holy and we gradually become more righteous, but that's not why we're saved. You know, one day when Jesus returns, we're going to be perfect. Like I look forward to that. I hope you do too. But that's not why we're saved. And it's not an expectation that God has for us in this life. We are saved to bring pleasure and glory to God. And his mercy, his grace, his love is displayed in the salvation and sanctification of sinners. This is not dependent on us keeping the law. This is not dependent on anything in us at all. 
Like, if it was dependent on us, I mean, we, we would have something to contribute, something to, to give that would add or contribute to our salvation. That's not what it is. It's all dependent on God as our Savior. And there's a passage in Ephesians that clearly outlines this, this motive and this purpose of salvation. It's Ephesians 1, 5 through 6. It says, In love, he, being God, predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So what I want us to see in this and focus on in this passage is that the reason we are adopted, the reason we are saved, is God's pleasure and God's will. That's why you're saved. It's not because you're better than someone else, and it's not because God expects you to be better than someone else. He saved you because he wanted to. And the result of this is the praise of God's grace. Like this should be something that actually, it really brings a lot of joy for us and worship to God. I'm hoping that this uh, gives us an, a new appreciation of God's love for his children. You know, the fact that we don't, we don't have to accomplish anything to be part of God's family is really encouraging. Because I don't know about you guys, but I fail in stuff that I want to do all the time. If it depended on us, we would be constantly worrying about whether or not we measured up. And since it doesn't, we don't have to worry. We're saved by God from first to last. And this frees us from the anxiety of legalism, right? Feeling like we have to do certain things in order for God to love us. And it also frees us from the despair that comes from recognizing how messed up we are. I mean, like, I don't know about you all. Again, I, I've had moments where I'm just like, dude, I really am not that good of a person. Like, I'm actually pretty horrible. And it, it really is encouraging and it drives me to thankfulness to remember that it doesn't depend on my ability to do good. So God promises, he promises to save and adopt all those who have faith in Christ. And he tells us in the Bible that this does not depend at all on our ability to measure up to the law. Now, I'm gonna be done soon, but the Apostle Paul is not done, right? So he has a couple chapters left. Uh, and I expect that next week we're gonna hear more about how we're supposed to use the freedom that we have in Christ. But for now, I just wanna look at, at one verse from chapter five of Galatians that kind of clarifies this message of freedom and it prevents us from, from thinking, well, now I'm free, now I can just do whatever I want. Right? That's uh, called antinomianism, and it's a heresy, just so you know. And so Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So the freedom that we have as heirs in Christ is to be used to serve and love, not to indulge in sin. Now, you might have just heard me say, you're free, but you're not really free. And you might have heard Paul just say that, but that's not what he's saying, right? We actually do this all the time. This type of freedom of choice is something we do all the time. Um, okay, who like enjoys the actual process of working out? Like the tearing of muscles, like the feeling, I know they exist. Yeah, I got like a couple hands, okay. I respect you, that is not true for me. I do not like working out in the moment. And I'm sure for many of you, you do not actually like the process of working out. The reason you go to the gym is because you enjoy the results <laughs> and you approve of the results. You want the results. Um, you know, the, you want the results more than you want to be comfortable. Um, does anyone keep, oh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't ask this question. <laughs> Some people set boundaries on how much they spend of their money, right? I don't know how common that is for, for college students. There's some, yeah, I'm sure there's some of you. I won't make you raise your hands. Um, some people like have a budget. They set boundaries on how much money they spend and what they spend it on. Why do people do that? Is it because you don't want things that you want? Like, no, that's a contradiction. Like we do that because we value having money to spend on important things rather than immediate gratification. Right, so th this, is, this is a type of choice we make all the time. We might want something in the short term and choose to go against or uh, wait on that desire in order for the result. And in this case, the result is pleasing God. Now, again, if you're, if you're at all grateful to God, if you love God, if you want to, to please him as your father, these are the types of choices that he calls us to make. He calls us to not indulge in our sinful nature, to not indulge in sin, but instead to use our freedom to serve other people and to love them. We're, we're free to make that choice. 
and we can look here, right, at the how love should shape our relationship with God, just like we looked at at the very beginning. If we love someone, we can put restrictions on ourselves in order to express that love. I think we all experience that regularly. Loving God means that we follow the moral guidelines he approves of, and then we avoid what he disapproves of, sin. Not because it contributes anything to our salvation, not because it fundamentally changes the nature of our relationship to God, but because we want to please him. And we actually value doing that above indulging in sinful desires. Right? That's why we should choose to please God with our freedom. And we can trust, by the way, that, that God is going to make us holy as his children. That's something he promises, is that we, we will grow in holiness, that we one day we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. We're going to be perfectly holy. Um, and we can have the confidence and peace knowing this is not a result of, uh, this is actually a result of our salvation. This is something that flows out of being saved, not a condition of salvation, something we have to do in order to be saved. So I hope that something from God's word uh, was really helpful for you tonight. I know that for me, like, I have really loved uh, learning more about the law of God and learning about its benefit for us today. Um, I would encourage you, if you have some applications, to think about those things and think about how you can choose to express love for God in your daily life.